At this time, I'm going to turn the floor over. We'll get out of the line right there. We'll turn the floor over to uh, Senator Paul. He's here uh, today to share with us a little bit about uh, what's going on in the state. I'll turn this off, Senator, so here's the microphone if you need it. All right. Uh, let me turn this off so you don't get blinded. There you go. All right, we'll see if I can go without the microphone for a while, too. I can usually do one speech without a microphone. It's about the second or third that I run out of voice, and then I'm raspy and unable to hear me. But um, I think it's great to be here, and I loved uh, hearing about your successes, you know, with the business. And when I come here as somebody who represents you in government, I think, well, what can we do to make it even better? So we have 204 employees. What can we do to, so we get 250 employees or 300 employees? And the things that I see from a federal government's point of view that we could do better is we have the highest corporate income tax in the world. And what we need to figure out is whether you're an, a manager, an owner, or a worker here, we are all connected. And so if you think, well, let's just tax those rich corporations and let's tax, you know, people who have all the money. Well, you know what? If you tax whoever owns this, because it's publicly owned, and you, you're probably taxing yourself because you may own some of the stock in a mutual fund. But the bottom line is it doesn't help any of us if we have the attitude we're going to tax corporations more. Because what it means is the jobs will go overseas and this furniture will be made somewhere else. So we have the highest corporate income tax in the world at 35%. Throughout Europe, which is a big government state, a lot of them are 20%. Ireland's 12%. To compete, we have to lower our corporate income tax. We are going to try to do that in the next couple of months. It's going to be probably three or four months till we get to it. But that is our goal this year, is to lower the, lower the corporate income tax. But really, I want to lower all of the tax rates so we can compete and so we can make things in our country. Because one of the big costs that businesses have is taxes. And so if we're higher than the rest of the world, the jobs and the businesses will go. In fact, people put it this way. They say, money goes where it's welcome, and the jobs go where the money goes. So if we don't make money and corporations welcome, they will leave us. But one of the key aspects to this, and I don't, I don't think we can say this enough, is that whether you are a beginning worker here, or you're in management, or you're the owner of the company, we are all interconnected, and it's not a zero-sum game. It's not if your boss makes more money, you make less money. Most people realize this, but we have to realize this as a country. Everybody makes more money when the company makes more money. And I'm sure they teach teamwork the same way a lot of corporations talk about teamwork, that we're all in this together. We have to figure that out politically. We're starting to figure that out when you work for a company that you're involved with it. We've got to figure it out politically that we're all interrelated. We want our country to do better. We need to talk about how we can get by with a lower corporate income tax so our businesses can thrive. The second thing we need to do to help companies, and it may not be particularly this company, but a lot of companies have a regulatory burden. Your banks have regulatory burden, a lot of manufacturing has regulatory burden, but if our regulatory burden is higher than the rest of the world, that also means jobs go elsewhere. Now, one of the reasons you know jobs go elsewhere is labor. We can't compete necessarily with labor, but you know, they've got cheaper labor than the rest of the world, but then they've got to ship it all the way back over here. So some of the advantages, at least I heard from some today, was that being able to, to manufacture your furniture more timely here has helped you to be able to keep some of those jobs here. But the regulatory burden has been increasing exponentially. So we've been through eight years of a presidency that truly believed we needed more regulations on every business. The argument, though, is not whether we have zero regulations or what we have. Really, what most of us are trying to do is just get rid of the additional regulations that are killing us. Okay? So there has been some level of regulations, and we can tolerate some of that. But it gets to the point in some industries where it gets so excessive that they shut down industries. The coal industry is the primary one. Coal industry has been killed and crippled in Kentucky, in Ohio, in West Virginia, in Pennsylvania because of regulations. So one of the things we did the last month, and it's funny, I was on television on Sunday and they were asking me, how come you haven't done, done anything? How come everything's in chaos and nothing's happening? And I said, well, I guess beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I kind of think things are going actually pretty well doesn't mean we don't have discussions and debate, but we repealed three regulations so far. It's the first time we have repealed a regulation in 20 years. The first one that we repealed was uh, something to do with streams and, and coal companies, 
and that would, if it were to be in place, um, the estimate was that we'd lose 77,000 more jobs in the coal industry. Add that to like we've we've lost between 15 and 20 thousand jobs in the coal industry already. So I think we are doing the right thing. We need to lower taxes so we can be more competitive. We need to lower regulatory burden so we can be more competitive. The other thing you're hearing a lot about in the news and that I've been in the middle of is um, one of the other cost businesses have is health care. Now people want health care. That's why they want a good job so they can get health care. But we got to figure out how we keep health care costs down. One of the reasons people don't have health insurance is because it's so expensive. I practiced medicine for 20, 20 years down in Bowling Green. And even before Obamacare, the complaint I always got was from businessmen and women and from individual uh, employers and owners was the price of their health insurance. So we've been complaining about that forever, even before Obamacare. So we got Obamacare, did it make that any better? They called it the Affordable Care Act, and some people call it the Unaffordable Care Act because it didn't help. Why didn't it help? It's a little bit technical, but I'll give you just a little bit of the reasons why Obamacare didn't work. The President had the assumption, President Obama, that you were not smart enough to choose your own insurance and that you might choose what he called uh, insufficient insurance. So they, they placed a mandate on every insurance policy. Every insurance policy had to have 11 items in it. And you heard all this debate, oh, we've got to have, we demand birth control. Well, what if you're 75 years old and you don't want birth control? You know, or what if you're 22 years old and you're a responsible male and you're not married and you don't want birth control? Should you have to pay for it? And the thing is, is once you added those things, they all sound good. Everybody wants every bit of coverage, but it costs something. So what happened is we added 11 mandates to every insurance policy, and guess what happened? The cost of the insurance policies all went up, and guess what happened? Young, healthy people didn't buy any insurance because we also told them you can get it after you're sick. And it was all well-intentioned. People were like, well, wouldn't you want people to get insurance when they're sick? Sure I do. I mean, I have a great deal of sympathy for people who have gotten terrible illnesses. And yet, we can't tell people they can get it after they're sick. We have to tell them they need to get insurance and keep insurance because if we do, people will give it up and they will go without insurance until they get sick and then they'll buy it. And then who's in the insurance pool? Only very sick people. So right now you have what's called the individual market of insurance. It's about 11 million people. People who work in companies that have insurance, there isn't really a problem. The system seems to be working pretty well. But if you're a plumber or a pest control person or if you have a, you're a carpenter and you have your own little business, it is hard because you're in an insurance pool of you and your wife. So let's say you own your business and it's you and your wife in the insurance pool. Two people in a terrible insurance pool to be in because you work and one of you will get seriously sick, your rates will go through the roof or you'll be dropped. But if you work for a group, 5, 10, 15, 20 employees or more, you get what's called group insurance. Nobody asks whether you're sick or not. It might be six months till you get your insurance after you start working, but it really doesn't matter if you have a sick spouse or if you get sick. It's just sort of built into the system. But the individual system is what's broken. So what I've been saying is let's get rid of Obamacare, it didn't work, but let's replace it with something. Some on my side have been saying, oh, we don't really need to replace it. I've been saying we absolutely need to replace it because there are people struggling who need insurance. There are people who are very sick who need insurance. So the, one of the ideas that I have is free up insurance and allow inexpensive insurance to be sold again. And I'll give you an example. I have three kids and my wife and I. There's five of us in our family. I bought my own insurance individually as a small business person, and I paid... This is for like 11 years. I started out about 3,200 a year, and I went up to about 4,800 a year. You can't get that policy now for more than $25,000 now. It had a big deductible, but didn't cover much of anything below the deductible. Now you have a big deductible, but you have all these mandates, birth control, pregnancy, everything that's covered below your deductible, and so it's really not a deductible, so you have high premiums and high deductibles. Anybody that's ever bought any kind of insurance knows if you increase your deductible, you're supposed to decrease your premium. That's a savings. You take some of the risk. We have to allow that to be legal again. Let you make the choice. Not everybody will want it. Some, but some people will say, you know what, I can save money for my family. I can get ahead by having a higher deductible policy with a cheaper premium. Let the consumer decide. Don't, let's not be so arrogant think government has to decide. So we legalize the sale of inexpensive insurance in my replacement plan. We let people save in health savings accounts. And the beauty of health savings accounts is twofold. One, it helps you to put money tax-free aside that you can pay your premium, you can pay your deductible, 
We let you pay for vitamins, weight loss, exercise, and we let you put in as much as you want. Now people say, well, poor people don't have any money to put in. Well, that is, that is true. There are going to be some people it's not going to work for it. But what if a third of the public got an HSA? If a third of the public had an HSA, and we give you a $5,000 tax credit. So if you pay $5,000 in income tax, you pay $5,000 less and it's your money and it goes into your health savings account. Then what would happen? Maybe a lot of people would have five, not everybody, but maybe a third of the public would have a five or a $10,000 deductible. What happens then? Those people shop for their health care. What's the next step that happens? They bid prices down. Contact lenses are typically not covered by, by insurance, neither is LASIK surgery. Price has gone down every year for 15, 20 years. The market works, capitalism works. So if you've got a lot of people that are asking the price. So right now, if you call a doctor, an eye surgeon, and say, I want to have LASIK surgery, every one of them will tell you the price over the phone. But if you call a general surgeon and say, my gallbladder's kind of been bothering me and I've got to have my gallbladder out, how much will it cost? They would just laugh. They have no idea. Even the surgeon has no idea. The hospital has no idea. Nobody does because nobody's really paying for this. And that's part of the reason the prices get bid up. So what we do is legalize all forms of insurance to be sold again, help people save for it with health savings account. It's not going to be perfect. It won't be everybody, but it'll be a lot of people will get involved in that. And then the third thing we do is something we should have done a long time ago. I don't think anybody should have to buy their insurance individually. I think you should be allowed to join an association. So an association would be maybe you belong to the chamber, maybe you belong to NFIB, maybe you belong to AARP, maybe you belong to NRA, any association you want. But it could be a national association and then you get your insurance through them. So if you've got mom and pop that own a pest control business, instead of them having to buy insurance worrying that one of them gets uh, cancer, those two people would join an association and they would buy insurance with 100,000 other people. Because the beauty is once you get to like 200 people, you can get a leverage on your insurance, you get group insurance, and nobody gets all these problems of cancel for pre-existing conditions. So there's 11 million people that have individual insurance. My goal is every one of them would no longer buy it individually. Shouldn't be anybody left in America who buys it individually. Everybody should be open to a, a, a buying it through an association. Why don't you have that now? Because the law prevents it. <clears throat> because we've made the laws restrictive and we've, we've done all of these things to destroy the marketplace. So I think if we encourage the marketplace, lots of new people get insurance and instead of Obamacare increasing the price, we'd have it less. Would everybody be covered? Probably not. We're gonna have some people who do, uh, that nothing seems to work in the marketplace and they have no money and can't get ahead. And we do have a backstop. We have government for that. We have Medicaid. But our goal shouldn't be to have everybody on Medicaid. Our goal should be that, yes, we're going to take care of those who can't take care of themselves, but it needs to be a small number. You don't want half of your community on Medicaid. You should want three or four or five percent on Medicaid, which means almost everybody else is working and has a job. And so then it gets back to the economy. How do we get the economy growing so we have more companies like this and you have three or four companies like this in Ohio County that are employing a couple hundred people? That's what you need to do, and that gets to economic policy. But for those who can't get a job or don't get a job, we can't take care of them. But our goal shouldn't be to have everybody on assistance. Our goal should be to have a few people on and as many people working as possible. I'm going to keep working uh, to see what we can do to make the system better because I realize what we have isn't working, but I also realize that what we had before Obamacare wasn't working very well either. And to my mind, when people talk about what makes America great, what has made us the richest, freest country on the planet, it's uh, the idea that freedom brings prosperity. Freedom means I can trade with you, I can sell my services if I'm a carpenter, we determine the rate between freely interacting people, prices go up and down, that's capitalism, it's the economic system, but it's, a, it's an amazing system. When you look around our country and see all the wealth we have, it's because of freedom. Freedom to trade with other individuals with very few rules other than you can't commit fraud, you can't lie to people, you can't sell them something that doesn't work. There are some rules. But if we realize that and open it up again, I really think that the, the future is, to me, a very uh, rosy future that I see if we start doing some good things. And from my where I sit and where I see what's going on with government right now, I think there's a very good chance this is going to be a good year. Thanks, everybody.
I'd be happy to take a couple questions if we have any questions. Comments? Speeches? <laughs> Just don't throw anything. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? Yes. What can we do to increase trade among the nations of the world and make America better? Because if we're not making it here on a global, in the global scene, then we're not making it a nation. Yeah. You know, as far as helping domestic stuff, I would say lower taxes and regulations. That helps domestic companies compete. Um, as far as what we should do with trade, it is sort of complicated. Some businesses thrive if we say, well, we're going to block imports of things that cheap and that are uh, undercutting them. I don't think that's really that realistic to be able to have sort of build a wall against products coming in. We also have to remember that we benefit from a lot of trade. So Ohio County is a rural county. Farming is probably the number one, uh, I would say, a money maker for Ohio County. Uh, farmers export 25% of what they grow. So farmers, when you talk to the Farm Bureau, are for trade, and so am I. But in Kentucky, as you go around Kentucky, you'll hear some businesses that are affected adversely by trade. But I can tell you several that like trade. Farmers like trade. Urban distillers like trade. Uh, Toyota likes trade. DHL and Amazon, it's an international shipper up in northern Kentucky, likes trade. The Dollar General stores in Walmart like trade. And... For everything that's sort of bad, there's another side to it when you think about trade. The average person that shops at Walmart, which is most of us, myself included, you save about $900 a year because you get uh, cheaper stuff that comes in. Now, I'm, I'm in a company that makes things domestically. They may not always have the same opinion on you know, having to deal with foreign competition. Um, but what we have to do is make it easier for companies to compete. And the one thing we can't do, companies can't pay a dollar an hour. And that's what they pay in these other countries. So in order to, we have to pay, you know, you've got to pay a marketable, reasonable wage in our country. Um, we have to do everything else we can. So labor is a cost, taxes are a cost, and regulations are a cost. We can't have the highest taxes regulation and have higher labor. So we've got to come down dramatically on our taxes and regulation. And uh, most of it is stuff that you really don't need. Most of the common sense uh, safety type of things that they do around here, uh, they would do for a lot of reasons. One, for liability. Two, because they care about their employees. And maybe three, you might have state regulations. You probably don't need any federal regulations to tell them how to make furniture, to tell you to. But I'll bet you they deal with about 500 different uh, federal regulations on how to build furniture, many of which probably involve pushing paperwork and filling out paperwork and may not be truly making people safer. Anybody else? All right. Thanks, everybody.